Shabbat Shalom, everyone. You may be seated. On May 11th of this year, just a handful of weeks ago, the Israeli Defense Forces were carrying out a mission from one of its elite squads in the Palestinian town of Jenin. There, their task was to arrest militants who were conspiring against the state of Israel and were planning to do acts of terror against the state of Israel. Being alerted to the presence of the IDF, the Hamas militants engaged in a firefight with the army. A firefight ensued for quite some time, and in the process of that fight, Shirin Abu Akleh, a journalist for Al Jazeera, was shot and instantly killed. Her death is a tragedy. Shirin Abu Akleh was a gifted and skilled journalist. She was a devout Christian, a mother, a sister, a daughter, and a friend to many. And most obviously, she was a human being. And her loss is painful for all. Sadly, her death is turning into political theater. The Palestinians are using her death to further their narrative. And Israel is using her death to push their narrative of Palestinians using innocent people and people who are protected by the United Nations and their charters as human shields. However, one fact can fix it all. If the bullet that killed Shireen Abu Akleh, which is in possession of the Palestinian Authority today, is released and is examined by an independent and trustworthy authority, it can be determined through ballistics who fired the shot and who is responsible. The Palestinians refuse to release that bullet to Israel for any form of ballistic inquiry. Even though most reports today point towards Israel as being the ones who shot the errant bullet. But until that time happens, opinions trump hard facts. The fact exists at all times. She was killed by a single bullet and by a single shooter. But what continues to happen in the absence of defining those facts is that opinion and narrative takes over. The Palestinian narrative of the oppression of the Israelis and the war crimes in which they commit, including killing journalists who work on their behalf, like for Al Jazeera, becomes the dominant narrative in their village and community. And the Israeli narrative is that we have no cooperation from the Palestinians and from Hamas, and they will continue to use innocent civilians, including journalists, as shields, human shields, in their effort to demonize the state of Israel. When it comes to opinion, narratives are subject to manipulation. Now, Judaism is probably the richest religion when it comes to passionate debate. One of the most popular stories about passionate debate is the story in the Talmud of the Tanor Shalach Nai, a question between two rabbinic authorities as to whether a particular stove can be used for cooking or it's richly impure. The details of the argument are inconsequential. But the argument shows between two sides what they were trying to define which is, what does God want from us? Rabbi Eliezer said it wanted one thing, Rabbi Yehuda said the other, and the two fought vigorously about one thing that they could not define. What was God's will? What is God's will and what God wants from us is something you and I can't define. If we could define that right now, 
there wouldn't be different streams of Judaism. There wouldn't be reform, conservative, and orthodox. There wouldn't be people who drive on Shabbat and people who don't drive on Shabbat. There wouldn't be observances that differ, and there wouldn't be some that eat rice on Passover and others who don't. So we are a religion that jumps into the deep end of the pool when it comes to opinion and debate. But at the same time, we are a religion that does not allow any ambiguity when it comes to the issue of facts. And what becomes so very dangerous is when we peddle lies or we stay silent in the face of dishonesty and the impact that it can have to our collective world. In the 1930s, in Munich, after the failed putsch of Adolf Hitler, the original big lie rose to the surface and it began to take shape. Adolf Hitler was assisted in this idea of the big lie by someone who eventually grew in his status in the Nazi party to be the minister of propaganda, one by the name of Joseph Goebbels. Both of these men, Hitler and Goebbels, were loaded with hypocrisies. For example, they both promoted the idea of the master Aryan race, which was tall, slender, light-skinned, and light-haired. But we know that Adolf Hitler had a jet-black mustache and jet-black hair. We also know that they pushed in this master race that everyone who was part of the German community had to be a part of. No physical defects. Yet we know that Goebbels wasn't even eligible to serve in World War I or to enlist in the German army because he had a club foot. According to the very rules that he established later for the Nazi party, he would have been killed for being imperfect and impure. Still, they manifested and stirred and added fuel and fire to this ongoing burning issue of the big lie and continuing to claim that the Jewish people were the ones responsible for World War I. And it was because of World War I that Germany faced so many social and economic challenges. And the Nazi propaganda continued to repeat that Jews held power behind the scenes with Britain, Russia, and the United States, and that is why World War I happened. And they took it a step further. They said that the Jews had begun a war of extermination against Germany, and they used that fact, which was fabricated, to assert that Germany had a right to annihilate the Jews in self-defense. Hitler wrote in Mein Kampf, and Goebbels later repeated these quotes. If you tell a lie big enough, and you keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. The lie can be maintained only for such time as the state can shield the people from the political, economic, or military consequences of that very lie. It thus becomes vitally important for the state to use all of its powers to repress dissent for the truth is the mortal enemy of the lie, and thus by extension, the truth is the greatest enemy of the state. Goebbels later said, as he rose to prominence in the Nazi party, that it is important to never let the public cool off, to stay angry at all times, that leadership should never admit a fault or wrong, they should never concede that there may be some good in their enemy. They should never leave room for alternatives. They should never accept blame. And they should concentrate on one enemy at a time and blame that enemy for everything that goes wrong. And that soon enough, people will believe that big lie. He even said that about Churchill in 1941 when talking about all of the things that Germany was responsible for, but pinning all of those things upon Britain. Now, 
What you need to know that's very important is that when the war came to an end in 1945, that ideology of hatred, of continuing that lie, of hating the Jews, didn't evaporate with the stroke of a pen. The inertia of that hatred continued for a very long time. In 1946, July 4th, a year plus after the war had ended, there was a horrible pogrom against the Jews in a town called Kielce in Poland. And the reason it happened is that the members of the town of Kielce said that they had kidnapped a small Polish boy and killed him and used his blood to make Passover matzah. A good old fashioned blood libel. Since when do we eat matzah on July 4th? This was absolutely fabricated, totally manufactured. And as a result of it, lots of Jews died in Kielce, Poland after the war. Why? Because the idea of lies and hatred and demonizing a people didn't evaporate in 1945 at the end of the war. In fact, Ricardo Clement, who was captured in Argentina in 1960 and had his true identity revealed as Adolf Eichmann, was outed because he attended many rallies that were supporting the ideology of the Nazi party. This hatred doesn't turn off in a day or a week or with a signature on behalf of a head of state. It takes generations to eradicate it. And it also can be brought back to life very quickly. If you wanted to talk today to the experts on truth and lies, the person who I would bring in is Professor Deborah Lipstadt, someone who we've been blessed to have grace our congregation multiple times, including on the high holidays, and someone that Dory and I are both blessed to call teacher and friend. Deborah Lipstadt wrote a book called Denying the Holocaust, in which she attacked someone by the name of David Irving, who was a well-known Holocaust denier. Irving sued her in Britain, and she had to defend herself to the tune of multiple millions of dollars and won the case. And there was a 359-page verdict that was written by the judge, 359 pages. And it boils down to this. The judge said that Mr. Irving has every right in the world to dislike or hate Jews. The judge said that Mr. Irving has every right in the world to have a large picture of Adolf Hitler hanging behind his desk, as he allegedly did. He has every right in the world to hate, but he cannot produce things that are not factual and say they're factual, like that the Holocaust never happened, or millions of people did not die, or that orders to kill Jews never came from Hitler, Eichmann, or von Zey and the Final Solution. That was illegal. What that judge was saying was totally in line, by the way, he was not Jewish, but it was totally in line with Jewish values. Jewish values are saying you are entitled to your opinion. You're entitled to your belief, even if it's abhorrent. But you are not entitled to create your own facts. There is only one set of facts. The judge wrote, the Nazis and the Nazi party did murder millions of Jews. They were responsible for the systematic extermination of the Jewish people. And that while we don't look to censor beliefs, we must censor facts that are inaccurate. What's just as powerful is that all of us in this room know, and it was proved in Nuremberg, the ironic place of the trial for the Nazi war criminals. That for those who sat silently, for those who said nothing during this time, for those who were quiet, that you were just as complicit in the crime. If any of us are sitting in a car and we drive our friend to a bank and they say, wait here for a minute, and we say, where are you going? 
and they say, I'm going in to rob the bank, and we don't stop them, we're an accessory to that crime. And so too, when we learn of the systematic annihilation and extermination of any people, and we do nothing as a people, we are complicit. It might not be as dirtying to our hands as those who put the Zyklon B in the showers, but we were still complicit and we didn't do enough to stop it for those who looked the other way or stayed quiet. There can be no contention that during World War II, under the direction of Adolf Hitler and Nazi leadership, and in von Zey, that the final solution for the Jewish people was implemented, and Jews were systematically exterminated. You and I, we, we can have vigorous, vigorous debate as to when life begins, at conception, at birth, at vitality and viability. We can have spirited conversation about whether we should cede land to Palestinians or we should hold on to it at all costs in the state of Israel. You and I can express countervailing opinions on the very best way to stimulate the economy right now. And you and I, we can opine in different directions as to the very best and wisest strategy to stop Vladimir Putin from continuing to wreak havoc in the Ukraine. However, there is no room for debate on whether the sun rises in the east. There is no room for conversation on whether the earth is flat. There is no place for us to engage in detailed conversation as to whether or not the Nazis killed six million Jews systematically. There is no place to question whether the charter of Hamas explicitly states for the eradication of the state of Israel. And while we can discuss and we can lament or we can be even unsatisfied with the results of an election, we cannot deny the free and fair results of said election because it suits our needs or it furthers our agenda or it helps a personal cause. Our tradition tells us in chapter and in verse, in more occasions that I have fingers and toes to count about the importance of sharing and expressing an opinion and creating space for those differing opinions. And it tells us just as many times how we as a people must be beholden to facts and truth. And there is no wavering. There is no such thing as alternative facts. In Parshat Ba'alotacha, when the menorah is kindled, we are reminded to put in the menorah Shemen Zayit Zach, the most pure olive oil. The reason why is that when we put pure olive oil in, we know the flame will continue to glow. But if we put a crappy olive oil in, a weak olive oil, one with sediment, one that isn't even made of olive oil, but an alternative oil, well, then that flame will flicker and it will go out. That is a teaching for our lives and the oil is truth too. When we are honest and true, there will be light in our lives guiding us in particular ways. Sometimes we might not like what we see in front of us, what that light shows us, but it is a source of truth. And when we contaminate that oil, what we realize is that light will flicker and it will go out. And when it goes out, we're gonna find ourselves rubbing shoulders next to people we can't see. And then when someone puts that olive oil in and the light goes on, we'll see that we're rubbing shoulders with the likes of those who created pogroms in Kiltsa, 
or the likes of those like Hitler and Goebbels, or the likes of those like David Irving who denied the Holocaust, or the likes of those like Hamas that deny the right for Israel to exist. And those aren't people we want our shoulders to be near. Let that light keep us away. Let it serve as a source of truth. Let us engage in meaningful and vigorous opinion and debate and celebrate those different opinions. But let truth be our compass and a light that serves as a disinfectant. Can you hear May that be God's will. Amen and Shabbat Shalom.